All aboard! Let's take a moment and ride back through time to where it all began. Railfest was created to celebrate our Twin Cities heritage. Yet today, we take for granted the impact railroading has had on our communities. These massive wonders screech through carrying goods from the Gulf Coast to all parts of the United States. But it wasn't so long ago that things were different, very different. So sit down, relax, and let's take a journey back to where it all began. What we know today as Texarkana was once populated by the Caddo Indian tribes. Their populations began to dwindle as pioneer families moved westward. In the late 1850s and 60s, the Cairo and Fulton Railroad from Arkansas and the El Paso and Pacific Railroads were building toward the state line, but the onset of the Civil War delayed the completion of the connection. In the 1870s, a railroad bridge was built over the Red River, allowing train travel from Texas all the way to Chicago. The railroad companies planned to meet not at the state line, but in Nash, four miles to the west. But the railroad executives decided it was simply easier to meet at the state line, which would create a natural town site. Texarkana might never have existed had it not been for poor decisions by the civic leaders in Rondo, Arkansas. Rondo, with 700 citizens, was the largest community in the area, and the Cairo and Fulton approached the town leaders for an incentive to bring the railroad through their town. Rondo hesitated at the idea of paying the railroad, and soon Rondo faded into history, dying out from simply one missed opportunity. The city of Texarkana, Texas was founded in 1873, and the railroad companies knew they had to extensively market the area to bring in development, and most importantly, people. Texarkana, the gate city of Texas, situated on the Great Trunk Line into Texas, direct from St. Louis, Memphis, and Little Rock. Texarkana is the natural inlet for trade and commerce and offers inducements that are unsurpassed for business houses of all branches of trade. Located here with facilities for shipment to all points of Texas and Louisiana, merchants will control the trade of a very large section of the country. In 1873, the Texas and Pacific began offering town lots for sale. Prices were set at $350 for corner lots and $300 for inside lots on Front and Broad Street. The first lot was sold to J.W. Davis and today is where the Hotel McCartney stands. Antonio Gallo, a native of Italy, purchased several lots where he opened a liquor store on the corner of what is now Main and Broad. A short while later, the Cairo and Fulton held an auction for town lots in Arkansas. The early settlers in what would be Texarkana were railroad men, loggers, immigrants, gamblers, land-hungry settlers, cattle rustlers, and entrepreneurs hoping to make a fortune. Texarkana offered opportunities for hard-working men to join the nouveau riche class. All they had to do was risk it all on Texarkana. Some went bust, but others thrived, building mansions and raising their families. Overlooked today is just a roadway, State Line Avenue was the brainchild of Colonel Rollin Rogers, who anticipated the nightmare of property divided by state, county, and city governments, and then sharing that problem with a neighbor. Rogers called it the curse of State Line, and he received land grants to create the 100-foot-wide State Line Avenue. No one at the time could have possibly foreseen what the future held for State Line. While Rogers alleviated the issue of property ownership, the curse of state line still reared its ugly head when it came to law enforcement. If a scoundrel broke the law on one side of state line, all he had to do to escape justice was simply walk to the other side. The state boundary line effectively curbed a sheriff's pursuit in either direction, and a frequent notation on Arkansas warrants for the arrest of some desperado was GT, meaning gone to Texas. Texarkana, Texas officially became a city on June 12, 1874. Captain O.T. Lyons was elected her first mayor. On August 10, 1880, six years after her older sister was founded, Texarkana, Arkansas was born. Quickly, a city government was established with H.W. Beadler as the elected mayor. Construction on both Front and Broad Street had already begun at a furious pace. A few churches were built, but by far, most of the businesses that founded the communities were saloons, gambling halls, and bordellos. Texarkana was born from the railroad, and in the early days, much of life revolved around the transportation industry. The town street grid was based on the lay of the railroad tracks, which was not based on a straight line. This led to many strange-shaped lots and unusual streets. All this added to the unique qualities 
of our communities. The railroad industry drove the economy and by 1885 the Daily Texarkana Independent reported that over 70 trains ran through the towns every day. August 19th, 1881. The St. Louis and San Francisco Railroad that had been expected to be built across the Indian Territory to Paris seems to have adopted Texarkana as its objective point and is now being built from Fort Smith in that direction. This and the extension of the Texas and St. Louis now being rapidly built will give Texarkana three lines of road to St. Louis and the north. It is giving Texarkana a boom and property there has advanced rapidly in value. And it looks like the place is going to be a great city in the future. Texarkana soon became a crossroads of America and was known as the gateway to the Southwest. The growth of this newly founded railroad town was mind-boggling. In 1880, the population was just 2,500, but just 20 years later, it had expanded to over 18,000 residents. But with that dramatic growth, came crime. One of Texarkana, Texas's early mayors, J.H. Drawn, was instrumental in trying to clean up the lawless frontier town. The little village was hardly more than two years old when a band of gamblers, swindlers, and others who live by their wits set up business and proceeded to get rich fleecing the honest citizens. Drawn organized a band of vigilantes that led to a raid one Saturday night. The offenders were lined up on Broad Street and marched at gunpoint to the city limits where the mayor informed them they would be shot on sight if they ever entered Texarkana again. The 1880s was a wild time in Texarkana with open saloons. The Paragon Saloon was one of the establishments and often advertised in the newspaper. Paragon, the best saloon in town. All the drinks are pure. Fish there do not get around, and you'll be pleased for sure. Go there every morning, noon, and evening. On our word, you'll be satisfied. None need fear their benzene. Railroad men and local residents often gathered in the saloon to drink liquor and smoke cigars. The Paragon was a popular saloon and gambling house, which also on occasion was used as a courtroom or a church. In 1882, the party ended for the Paragon. New York Times, July 14, 1882. A special dispatch from Texarkana says last evening a heavy wind and rainstorm accompanied by lightning visited the town. Half an hour later, Anthony Gallo's new building, a large three-story brick edifice almost completed, was struck by lightning and fell on a mass on top of a framed building known as the Paragon Saloon, burying everything beneath the ruins. The lamp in the saloon set fire to the ruins underneath, burning slowly upward. Terrible excitement prevails. Although it was almost impossible to endure the heat a hundred feet away, a noble band tried to save the remains. Sally Reese, Texarkana Gazette. Death rode with the bolt of lightning that stabbed down through the furious wind and rain which buffeted a youthful Texarkana on the night of July 12, 1882. A few of them came out alive. Most of them were carried out dead, and some were burned to ashes in the fiery holocaust. That night about dark, we heard the church bell ring. It was used as a fire alarm also. We knew something had happened. I ran uptown to find the wind had blown the guile house onto the Paragon Saloon and Gambling House, usually filled with men. We could hear some of them crying for help. In the meantime, fire from the coal oil lamps had started under the mass of debris. There were no fire hydrants then, so we formed a bucket brigade to carry water from various wells and poured thousands of buckets of water on that crushed building. The guile building had a tin roof and covered the rooms of the Paragon, which prevented the water from getting into where the fire was burning. The historical record varies widely on the number of those killed in the tragedy, but 28 bodies were removed. W.B. Weeks. Many persons lost their lives in the Holocaust, but the exact number will never be known. Estimates made at the time varied. The lowest placed the number at 35 and the highest at 80. Persons best in the position to know, however, generally agreed that 52 was about the total number killed. Early mayor and popular bartender Billy Russell was one of those lost in the fire. Some saw the fire as God's punishment on the sins of Texarkana. Today, part of the bi-state complex sits over the site of this heartbreaking chapter in Texarkana history. As the town rose with the demand of the railroad, so did the town's nefarious factors. Brothels and saloons dotted the landscape in the Swamp Poodle District on the Texas side. Some of our citizens are complaining that body houses are being permitted to exist. We think that if they are to be tolerated at all, they had better be down in the city where the police can watch them, than in the outskirts of the city where they prove to be an annoyance to families. 
The Swamp Poodle District was named after a creek that still runs through the area, and the Swamp Poodle girls made it memorable. Front Street was virtually ignored by the residents of Texarkana, and the activities found there were only whispered about in polite society. The divided towns had yet another division between Front Street and Broad. The girls on Front Street often stayed on Front Street, while just a block away, polite society on Broad ignored the body houses. The 1900 federal census lists several of these houses. Two of those houses on Front Street are captured here. The madams that ran them were listed as the heads of households. The most well-known madams in the day were Lottie Belmont, Zoe Goldie Leroy, and Kitty Stone. Both houses were conveniently located next to the Cosmopolitan Hotel and across the street from the railroad. In the 1860s, Scott Joplin, who would one day become the king of ragtime, was born near Linden, Texas, and moved as a young child to the bustling city of Texarkana. His early musical training came from his father, Giles Joplin, an ex-slave who played the fiddle, and his mother, Florence Gibbons Joplin, who played the banjo. His father worked as a railroad laborer in Texarkana while his mother cleaned houses. Joplin attended the Orr School on Laurel Street and lived on State Line Avenue. Historians believe Joplin learned how to play the piano in one of the houses his mother cleaned. And his talent didn't go unnoticed. A local German music teacher, Julius Wies, provided young Joplin a free formal education in music. In 1891, Joplin worked as a member of the Texarkana Minstrels in a performance to raise money, ironically, for a monument to commemorate the Confederacy. Joplin discovered there were few opportunities for a black musician in his time, and he earned a living playing piano in various red light districts across the U.S. In 1893, Joplin played the Chicago World's Fair and doors began to open. Joplin's Maple Leaf Rag was published in 1899 and revolutionized music. However, the popularity of ragtime began to decline by 1917 when Joplin died in New York City. Scott Joplin came of age right here in Texarkana. Henry Ward of Mott recalled this wild time in Texarkana in his manuscript, The Meek Shall Inherit. On the 4th of July, some of us took the morning train to Texarkana for the Independence Day celebration. There was to be a barbecue with public speaking, a parade, ball game, and a lot of hoopla. There was a red light district on Swamp Poodle Creek, and some of the men went there. Bob Turner persuaded me to go with him to the back room of a saloon where there were card and dice games. Bob begged me to loan him the money to get in the game. I lent him the table stakes of $10, and his luck was phenomenal. He bet it all, doubled and redoubled it, and in less than an hour had $1,400 in front of him. Sure enough, Bob's luck failed, or when they switched him to loaded dice, Bob and George and I went to a couple of more saloons for more drinks than out to the picnic grounds for the barbecue. When the music stopped and the speaking started, we went back to town for more drinks. And when we was walking along Broad Street after visiting some more saloons, I suddenly blacked out and have never remembered anything that happened the rest of that day and night. I was told that I became belligerent on the train and that the conductor pulled the stop cord and had the train backed up all the way to Texarkana and had me arrested. When I came to in the jail the next morning, I found that I had given the police a good account of myself and they'd paid it back as well. Because of the beating I'd had, the judge did not find me, but had a doctor care for my injuries. In a valiant effort, the railroad companies built a massive YMCA on Front Street in a failed attempt to provide wholesome entertainment to the railroad employees. Living in the big city of Texarkana wasn't all that bad. Telephone service arrived early to the Twin Cities. In 1883, Southwestern Telegraph and Telephone Exchange began local service. The telephone was big news in our communities, but Colonel E.A. Warren, the editor of the Texarkana Daily Independent, had some concerns. That the telephone is a great convenience, all will admit. But in this city, it is not as much so as it should be. Because times are so hard that the people cannot afford to pay $5 a month for its use. Let the rates be reduced, and then we believe we will see a telephone in almost every business house in the city. Warren was partially correct. Soon telephones were not only in businesses, but in residential homes. Warren wasn't shy about calling for the implementation of new technologies. 
Why not have electric street lamps? It's awful dark for newspaper men to prowl around at night. In a town hit hard by many, many fires, Texarkana residents had a waterwork system by 1885. A large number of plugs or hydrants have been taken by the city, and a sufficient number will be secured, regardless of the cost, to do efficient service in the case of fire. Texarkana was blossoming into a city, but still there were issues. It's hard for us to imagine today what a lawless town our communities were. But with the curse of state line, Texarkana was sometimes a haven for criminals. Texarkana is the gateway between the east and Texas, and the halfway house where burglars, thieves, and robbers stop momentarily to recuperate. By 1896, Texarkana was a bustling town and far more advanced than its neighbors. Texarkana had schools, a waterworks plant, an electric light plant. Five miles of streetcar lines, daily and weekly newspapers, an ice factory, a cotton mill, and even a sewer system. And the local economy was simply booming. The railroad companies provided even more economic development and job opportunities when the rail yard became the main repair station for many of the regional railroads. Downtown exploded, not just from the local residents, but also from the economic development brought in by the tourism trade. In his memoirs, Opening Memories Door, Henry C. Ward remembers the excitement he felt as a young boy visiting Texarkana. Papa had been reared near Texarkana, so he knew the town. He did not skimp, but gave us the full treatment. First, we went to a plush drugstore for ice cream sodas all around. That was new to us. We went into five and ten cent stores, grocery stores, and clothing stores. We even peeked into barber shops, pool halls, and saloons. When dinner time came, he took us to a good restaurant and ordered for all of us. Oscar, who was my uncle but not quite 14, was with us. When Papa asked Grandpa to come along, he said it was all darn foolishness and it'd be better to save the money. But he let Oscar go and he gave him the money for expenses. During the sightseeing, I became separated from the others and caused an uneasy search. Oscar found me huddled against a dime store window to look at the pretties and get out of the grown-up traffic. As trade traffic increased and Texarkana gained population, more goods and services were provided by local businesses. Texarkana went from a frontier town to a bustling city. In 1904, the circus came to town and little Henry Ward was there to see it. When I was almost nine, Ringling Brothers Circus came to Texarkana, about 40 miles away from Stamps. Circus day came at last and we all got up at 4 o'clock. Papa hitched Buck to the hack for the trip to Stamps. The Cotton Belt Railroad ran long special passenger trains to Texarkana just for the circus goers. We reached Texarkana in plenty of time for the parade. It was a marvelous sight. Matched horses with glittering harnesses and bells, gaily painted wagons, all the caged wild animals, Huge elephants, some with riders, ambling along. As time for the big performance drew near, we went to the edge of town where the tents were set up. Papa left us at one side while he went for the tickets. The sideshows kept us busy for an hour, gazing at the fat lady, the giant, the bearded lady, the dwarfs, and many others. Wild animals were in a second tent where a lion gave out a loud roar that kept us well away from his cage. At last, we went into the big tent to a scene we could not imagine. Inside, the vendors were hawking their wares. Peanuts, popcorn, Cracker Jacks, and candy. All five cents or a nickel. Ice cold lemonade made in the shade. Stirred with a spade, the best lemonade that was ever made. We were all excited and had seats with a good view of all three rings. Humans and animals strutted into the tent. Would have taken three pairs of eyes to watch the three rings plus two or three more pairs to watch the trapeze and aerial artist. Since then, I have seen many circuses and shows, but that was the best of all. After the circus, a tired but happy crowd slowly dispersed. It was back to the long train ride for us boys. At Stamps, Papa brought Buck in the hack. I remember a quilt with another for cover in the back of the hack. But the day really ended for us when we got off the train. At the turn of the century, Henry Moore Jr.'s diary gives us insight into what life was really like in Texarkana. The diary was recently discovered on the property of the Ace of Clubs house where Moore lived. Just imagine, in only 30 years, Texarkana grew from a railroad workers camp into a big city. May 5th, 1905. Mr. Buchanan called me into his office this morning and told me to draw up papers for the funny Lewis Lumber Company a new corporation he's forming with $425,000 in capital. 
He said father was going to leave and he wanted me to know how to do such things. Fires continued to gut and destroy downtown buildings. With each fire, downtown was reshaped as the owners quickly recovered their losses and reinvested it back into the city. In Moore's diary, the commonplace fires are notated. March 31st, 1905. Last night, mother waked me about 1 a.m. as there was a large fire near here. The entire block adjoining is burned. One brick building, two or three boarding houses, and a hundred or two bales of cotton. Spent today at the office working, and this afternoon rode out and played tennis. Coming back, I had a race with a man on a bicycle and easily cleaned him up. Dan, my horse, can run some. April 29th, 1905. Worked at the office today. Called this evening at Mrs. Offenhauser's. Just as I was starting to leave, the Baptist church near Mr. Falk's caught on fire, and we all went to see same. The Falk's house came near burning, but the wind changed in time to save the house. As the new century unfolded, Texarkana continued to grow. American boys were shipped off to fight in World War I. Troop and freight trains ran through the community 24 hours a day. The ladies of the Red Cross would sit in front of the Texarkana National Bank and knit for the soldiers. The local economy kicked into high gear and residents provided entertainment for troops at a Red Cross canteen. Texarkana sent many of her sons by train and they eventually went on to France to fight for the cause. Many came home but 59 others did not. Otis Henry was gassed in France in October of 1918. His mother paid for an incredible monument to be built at Rose Hill Cemetery in tribute to her lost child. The 1920s were electrifying in Texarkana. The communities quickly grew as a main stopping point on travelers' adventures. Texarkana offered up entertainment and the finest hotels in the area. Luxurious for its time, in 1925, the Hotel Grimm opened her doors and the issue of a divided city was put to rest. Every business, including competing hotels on both sides of the state line, pulled together and celebrated the massive change brought by the Hotel Grimm to the Texarkana skyline. And that was not the only change coming. For many years, the only depot in Texarkana was on the Arkansas side. Texas residents went to the state legislature and a law was passed forcing all trains to stop in Texas for 30 minutes before crossing the state line. In 1889, the Arkansas depot burned to the ground. In the 1890s, the first Union Depot was built. The massive red brick building became a gathering spot for many social and political events of the day. By the 20s, pressure was building for a new, more modern facility for weary travelers. In 1927, four of the railroad companies created Texarkana's Union Station Trust to construct and operate a new train station. On May 12, 1930, the Texarkana Chamber of Commerce sponsored a cornerstone laying celebration. A chamber spokesperson stated that the completion of Union Station was the most momentous event in the history of the city. The new Cosmopolitan Hotel was built in 1887, replacing the original Cosmopolitan, built in 1876 on one of the first town lots sold. The hotel provided guests with all the luxuries of the time. The Cosmopolitan hosted all of the great entertainers of the day, including Will Rogers, John Barrymore, Douglas Fairbanks Sr., and Annie Oakley. William A. McCartney inherited the business from his father and proved to be a creative businessman. McCartney decided Texarkana needed a bigger and even more luxurious hotel. McCartney wanted to build a monument to the future of Texarkana. The Cosmopolitan was demolished and the Hotel McCartney was built in her place. She was the first sight train travelers saw when they stepped from Union Station. The Hotel McCartney wasn't the only landscape change in the 30s. The U.S. Federal Building built in the 1890s was replaced in 1932. The new Federal Building was built at a cost of $500,000. Right before the Great Depression hit, the railroad brought in even more job opportunities when the railroad mail terminal opened within New Union Station. 
private industry was also booming. The Dickey Clay Manufacturing Company, the Wood Preserving Corporation, the Glass Factory, and the Texarkana Casket Company all decided Texarkana was the perfect location for their businesses. When the Great Depression rolled into town, many businesses were hard hit, and the number of residents who were unemployed skyrocketed. However, the hardy citizens of Texarkana found a way to manage through those difficult years. Fate would intervene when the federal government announced the construction of the Red River Army Depot and the Lone Star Army Ammunition Plants. The economy began to bounce back. Both the depot and the ammunition plant relied heavily on train travel to ship in supplies and ship out what would become much needed supplies for World War II. By 1948, Texarkana was one of the major railroad centers in the Southwest and was the crossroads of four important railroad systems. Industries continued to pop up in the area fueled by the natural resources, including the rich timberlands, the fertile agriculture lands, livestock, and the many mineral deposits. All of these industries needed the proximity of the railroads to ship their goods to markets all over the country. By the 1950s, the communities recorded a population of 52,000 people, but passenger travel began to wane as Americans chose to drive to their destinations. The Dwight D. Eisenhower National System of Interstate and Defense Highways project was begun with the Federal Aid Highway Act in 1956. The original portion of the interstate system was completed 35 years later, and with the creation of the interstate, Americans turned their backs on train travel, opting instead for passenger car or air travel. With the decline of passenger train travel, the cities lost a valuable industry, the tourist trade. Downtown development stalled, and as people moved out of the downtown area, businesses followed. Over the years, many catastrophic accidents occurred in the dangerous rail yards, but nothing compared to the massive explosion felt and seen in 2005 all over town. A tanker car transporting flammable gas derailed in the switchyard and exploded, killing one person and forcing the evacuation of hundreds from their homes. The accident was caused when a train coming in from Chicago hit the back of another freight train in the rail yard. Surprisingly, none of the railroad crew members were injured in the accident. Today, the trains still run through Texarkana, but we've grown accustomed to their noise. Texarkana has been a transportation hub for the United States, and today, much remains the same. The tourists still come to the federal courthouse to take the iconic State Line Avenue photograph. They still stop and spend the nights in our hotels and eat in our restaurants. But now, right now, there's a dream, a movement to bring back the glory days of tourism in Texarkana. A new day is dawning and downtown Texarkana is slowly starting to rise from decades of neglect. Take a stroll down the street and look. There are businesses and people living in downtown Texarkana. We have the opportunity today, right now, to make a lasting impact. Our two cities can work together and become what we once were, a destination. Arg, meaties and lossies. It's time to get your pirate on and come out to the Pirates Ball hosted by the Texarkana Renaissance Fair and the Texarkana Museum System. It's June 21st from 7 p.m. until midnight at the historic Ace of Clubs house. Tickets are just $30 each and are available at the Texarkana Renaissance Fair and at the Texarkana Museum System Facebook pages or at all the museum locations. Arg, come out and have a jolly good time and let's hope you don't have to walk the plank.
Texarkana Museum's system presents the Texarkana Phantom Ghost Walking Tour. A creepy 60-minute tour of downtown Texarkana filled with historically accurate stories of ghostly encounters. During the tour, you'll learn about the dark side of historic Texarkana. Our tour starts and ends at the Ace of Clubs house, but includes a mile-long journey you won't soon forget. For more information, log on to Texarkana Phantom Ghost Walking Tour on Facebook or call 903-908-2004. So you think there's nothing to do in Texarkana? Well, think again. The Texarkana Museums System has a whole lot to offer. We have the Ace of Clubs House, the Museum of Regional History, the Ahern House, and the Discovery Place Children's Museum. Why not take the kids out and see what Texarkana really has to offer? Family memberships start at just $75. For more information, call the Texarkana Museums System at 903-793-4831.